Hello and welcome back to the world at H12. My name is Alan and this week we have Roger Chickering on the podcast. And we are going to talk about Wilhelm II, the last Kaiser. And how did what do you think is come to the mind of people when they hear about Wilhelm II? And what do you think is most captured popular imagination of him? Um, well, I think it corresponds pretty much to the uh, impression that he made himself at the time, which is to say uh, that he was a kind of um, a very loud, very boisterous, very provocative um, man who enjoyed very much being in the spotlight uh, so that he was the, the face uh, of Imperial Germany, certainly during uh, the last 25 years. Uh, of that regime. And I have the impression that that's probably what most people think when they think of, well, what we used to call over here, Kaiser Bill. Mm. So let's let's begin with his childhood. And of course, to understand anyone, how, how they end up being, we kind of have to go back to the childhood. And as normal in the whole of family, he did not necessarily get on the well with his father in the early years, did he? Well, no, but the uh, probably the more important of his two parents was his mother, um, a very, uh, should we say, um, comprehensively involved uh, woman who was also the daughter of the English queen, Victoria. Uh, and she and she had the support of her husband in this was uh, determined that William was going to become a liberal empire. And then he was going uh, emperor, and he was going to steer uh, the German political system in the direction of a parliamentary regime, much like uh, the monarchy. <clears throat> but it must be said, this whole story was extraordinarily complicated by the circumstances in which uh, Kaiser Wilhelm was born. Born as a, a <laughs> not as the Kaiser, but the Kaiser to be um, during uh, during the course of his birth, it was a breech birth, um, he had to be forcibly extracted uh, from the womb in the course of which uh, he suffered uh, nerve damage in his, in his uh, shoulder and um, upper neck with the result that he had a withered arm uh, with which he lived for the rest of his life. Um, this was something that, that his mother in particular found terribly distressing because she believed it was going to limit him in what he was able to do and certainly um, limit the impression he was going to make. So she undertook in her rearing of him to make sure or to try to make sure that he would excel in everything uh, that he did, cost what it might. And it was an extraordinarily painful childhood for the boy uh, both physically and mentally, in that he always found himself for striving after things that he um, felt that he couldn't do. Uh, and it's a tribute to his determination that he turned out to be as physically agile as he was. But the impact of this constantly uh, striving after an unattainable um, ideal of him own, of himself, um, has clearly played out or clearly played out uh, in his adult behavior uh, as well. Um, <clears throat> amongst other things, it's, it's um, a, a, a case of his trying to find approval from others by always being uh, in the limelight. If you want to put you know, the psychiatric name on it, it's called narcissism. Uh, there's a very good book on exactly this, uh, this subject by uh, the son of the psychiatrist Hans Kohut, this is Tom Kohut, uh, whose book uh, William and the Germans makes this case very strongly uh, that um, his narcissism was the governing force in his in his behavior. Hmm. Now, it's my understanding that, like you said, it did not get on very well with his father, but it did, did seem to get on well with his grandfather, who was not the Kaiser at the time, but the king of Prussia, because it wasn't unified until the 71. As we, and again, if I may refer to our episode with James J. Sheehan, in, where we talked about the Prussian Empire, we, 
yeah. with the days of course the king of Prussia still not Kaiser of Prussia his grandfather Wilhelm the first um well he did get along well with his his grandfather um probably better than he did his own father who didn't get along so well with his father in turn uh but the the father was a more remote um presence in his in his growing up there's no question but his mother was the dominant figure um and the grandfather then died when Wilhelm was what 18 or 19 years old um <clears throat> at which point he had faced an entire life in which he was being groomed, as it were, in two different settings. The one at home by his mother, which was politically directed towards his becoming a liberal representative of a, of a constitutional monarchy. The other being uh, the Prussian royal court. And you're quite right about that, where the influence was very much uh, on the military and the, uh, the um, value, the virtue, of the uh, the military and authoritarian values uh, that were prominent uh, in the Prussian and then in the German monarchy. And mm. um, of course, let's talk a little bit about Otto von Bismarck as well, because he does help the young Kaiser to the young Kaiser to be that he is still to help him shape his image as well. That he when during his childhood and they do i do believe they travel to russia together as well man, at some points <clears throat> i don't know that but you it could very well be uh bismarck <clears throat> had several uh things in mind in his in his dealings with the young man um the first of which was to make a loyal bismarckian out of him which is to say that bismarck anticipated ruling under him and wanted to make sure uh, or to assure that he, Bismarck, would have a relationship uh, with the young Kaiser that he had had with the Kaiser's grandfather. Uh, and, and this would I, backfire, of course, as, as we will see later. Yes, that certainly did backfire. Um, it should be said that, um, that William's father shared his mother's views about, um, about the virtues of a parliamentary uh, liberal system. And there's little doubt uh, that he, had he not died early and remained uh, monarch, he was only in his late 40s when, uh, uh, when this all happened, um, he would have soon broken with Bismarck. And Bismarck knew it. So the idea was to make sure that the son of the son uh, had a better, say, a better um, uh, posture with regard to the authoritarian aspects of the constitutional system. <clears throat> so, that's, because it does go to send them away, because as we talked about, so Russia was a military state, and it's often said that Russia was a military with a state, with a state with a military, but then his father and mother, it's my understanding that they tried to send him away on board, is to get away from the military aspect of pr the Prussian rule. Is, is that something? Um, yeah, in particular, his mother, uh, I believe. Well, you see, the um, the influences are going in two different directions here. So it's a kind of uh, it's a kind of competition for the heart and soul of the young of the young boy uh, during the course of his education. Um, it seems likely that um, the tensions between the mother and the son uh, predisposed the young William uh, more and more towards the direction of the of the Prussian court and, lest it be forgotten, the army itself. In other words, he he entered the army as an eleven or twelve year old boy in various capacities, and he's undergoing real military training uh, to the extent that he is able. Uh, from a very early stage in his life. Hmm. And, and there's something else as well. You mentioned Queen Victoria, and I want to talk a little bit about this as well before we go into it later, I'm sure, is that, of course, there is you have three cousins that will rule the throne of England, and that is, of course, I don't, yeah. I don't remember the English king's name, but Nicholas II, 
and we'll we'll have and of course the people of England well, as well. They are all three cousins that would later like rule the throne. Yeah, with the, the king was George V, um, that um, <clears throat> who was the son of Edward the Seventh, who was in turn um, Uncle Edward uh, to William uh, the Second, as well as to Nicholas the Second of uh, of Russia. Hmm. So, so let us talk about because I feel like we have to talk about this as well. The brief ninety days reign of Williams Wilhelm's father. Um, I want to talk a bit about because nobody really took him. It's my understanding that he was already dying at this point, and nobody really took him very seriously. So they more took more or less took orders from his son Wilhelm the Second. But let's talk a little bit about his reign. Did he accomplish anything during? His night and day reign. Um, nothing of any particular importance. The problem was, as you said, um, it was clear that he was he had throat cancer, advanced throat cancer, uh, when he took the throne, and that also meant that he could not talk, uh, which meant it very diff made it very difficult for uh, the statesman uh, to deal with him. And um, the longer he, he ruled, the more incapacitated he became, became. And it lasted, as you said, about three months. And um, very little was accomplished at the time in the anticipation that a new ruler was going to take the throne. So did Wilhelm II dictate things kind of as a regent in a way under, under Frederick III's reign? I... My impression is that uh, Bismarck was still very much the, the principal person uh, in the government at that time. And he remains so, albeit with increasing tension with his chancellor or his minister president as his own William own rel, uh, um, reign uh, advanced. And as things turned out, it wasn't even two years uh, that uh, William II and Bismarck uh, were, as it were, joint regions in this whole thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because Wil Wilhelm fired him in March of 1890. Hmm. Let's, let's talk mean, about that. How, yeah. Let's talk about the firing of Bismarck. Didn't kind of Bismarck see it coming if he wouldn't remain? And let's talk about Bismarck's successor as well. And how, more what was it like to, for him to take over the not a throne, but the takeover as Iron Chancellor after the legendary Bismarck's rule reign over Prussia. Well, okay. Um, there are a number of aspects to this whole thing. Um, the what everyone had come to think of the relationship between uh, the monarch and his principal statesman uh, when Germans were thinking about this subject in. Uh, in 1888, as as the new uh, the new monarch took the throne, had been determined been determined entirely uh, by the relationship between Bismarck and William the First, and the reign of Frederick the Third, William's father, was not long enough for there to be any patterns established on how uh, the new uh, monarch and Bismarck we're going to interact, although <laughs> lots of statesmen and other observers were anticipating uh, that it would be a very tense relationship as it was really almost from the start. The, the new monarch was a headstrong young man, uh, was quite clear to everybody who had known him. Uh, the two of them managed to get along uh, reasonably well, uh, Bismarck trying to uh, re-establish the relationship he had had with William's grandfather, uh, and William trying very much to resist this, figuring that uh, he was going to become eventually, in effect, his own um, his own chancellor. Hmm. So, what are some of the things Wilhelm do when he first acquired, finally acquired, you might say, acquired a top trump? Because it's quite young, considered compared to Russian. Sorry, not Russian, but Prussian 
monarchs, because most Prussian monarchs are quite old when they regain the throne, but I believe Wilhelm II is just 27 when they became, become Kaiser of, 27, 28 years old when they become Kaiser of Prussia. Yeah. Well, um, one of the effects of his upbringing uh, was that he was a man of supreme <laughs> uh confidence or or faith in his own abilities uh and that he chaffed under Bismarck's attempts uh to what should we say guide him uh in the realms of statesmanship and it wasn't long before uh very touchy issues uh came up over which the two men clashed uh the first being a very large strike of German miners in the Ruhr area, <clears throat> which Wilhelm <clears throat> uh, was being counseled to send in uh, the army. Uh, and Wilhelm himself said, this is not a good sign if I now, as one of the first acts in my reign, send the, the soldiers in to shoot miners, because I would like to be thought uh, the emperor of all my people. And thus he did something that would have been inconceivable by, by, his, by his grandfather. He actually received the delegation of the striking miners and asked them about their grievances and said that he sympathized with them, uh, but that he did not like the idea that they were uh, um, followers of the social Democrats. <clears throat> well, Bismarck was appalled by this uh, because he was persuaded that um, the way to deal with socialist workers was to extend the series of laws that had basically outlawed the Social Democratic Party, which was up for renewal in 1890. It was on this issue that the two men, William II and Bismarck, frontally clashed. And um, Wilhelm said basically, no, we're not going to do it. Um, Bismarck thereupon says, well, uh, then I'm going to resign. Uh, a trick that he had pulled many times with the grandfather, and the grandfather always said, I cannot rule without Bismarck. And this Wilhelm said, well, I'd be delighted to rule without you. And he accepted mm. uh, the uh, the resignation, and that was that. Mm. Now, what, what about his, such said, Bismarck's successor? Who does he hire in his place? <laughs> Well, first of all, the choice of a successor was entirely his, and he knew it. He also knew that, practically speaking, um, he was in a position to do a great deal of things by the terms of the Constitution, that he did have far-reaching autocratic powers, uh, including naming all of his, um, of his uh, both his Imperial German and his uh, Prussian um, officials. And so he looked around <clears throat> and he found someone who looked to be ideal, a man of extensive military background, background in both the army and the navy, and a man knowing, uh, known for not being um, a, a particularly loud fighter. His name was Leo von Caprivi. Uh, and um, William calculated that he would be much better suited to be a kind of uh, aid uh, rather than a, a yes man yeah well put <clears throat> and uh, for the most part that's what caprivi was willing to do hmm. now i want to talk a little bit about his the alliance because he of course as we will talk about more in the future one of the more famous alliance of the late russian reign of wilhelm ii is of course the ottoman Russian alliance and Ottoman German alliance, if you will. So let's talk a little bit about how this alliance came about. And I want to bring up, and we talked a little bit about this in our episode on the rise of Turkey as well, and where it makes sense that Ottoman Tur Turkey wanted to be alliance with Prussia because they had no interest in the Middle East, right? Whereas France and Britain at the time, they were very much interested in carving up the empire, so that the, the alliance made sense because as my, it's my understanding that Germany at the time did not have really any interest in the Middle East, they had their own colonies in Africa to worry about, and that wasn't more enough for them, my understanding. So 
let's talk a little bit about the Ottoman Turkey Alliance, so this came about. Um, it came about in, in October 1915, after the, after the outbreak of the war. <clears throat> and um, the, let's say, not, not all of the geopolitical uh, um, influences pointed in that direction, because one of, the, one of the complicating factors is that Germany's principal ally by this time was Austria-Hungary. Uh, which also had um, um, its own issues in the Balkans, so that the, that the uh, Austrian-Turkish tensions were not inconsiderable uh, as well. But um, <clears throat> the German interests in that part of the world um, had to do with, well, um, um, a... a um, a, a kind of counterweight uh, to Russia in the East. Strategically, it looked to be a, 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 a valuable thing. And it, about this time, uh, the German fleet, like other fleets, were beginning to switch uh, to oil as the principal fuel. Uh, the Turkish connection uh, promised to ease the, the access to Middle Eastern oil. So by this time, the idea of a German presence in the Ottoman Empire uh, had become a particularly attractive thing, particularly given the, uh, the German project to build a railway uh, that would stretch mm. all the way to Basra uh, in, in what is today Iraq. Mm. And I want to talk a little bit about as well, because Wilhelm does travel to Ottoman lands and visit Egypt and, of course, the famous Tomb of Saladin is one of the famous stories around the Wilhelm II as well. So let's talk about Wilhelm II's travel to the Middle East and his and the diplomatic goal of this journey. What did that the diplomatic goal was? Where? Well, it's 1903, and the principal site of his visit was Jerusalem, uh, at, at a time in which it was under the the Ottoman uh, Ottoman rule, and it was. Um, it was Wilhelm's desire at this time, as he said explicitly, that he was going to become the champion of uh, Islamic peoples around the world. Uh, another thing that caught headlines, it, um, it mystified some of his own advisors, but it made uh, quite a stir and sort of set this theme in the Kaiser's mind uh, that his presence in that part of the world uh, was expected and would be welcome. Hmm. So the, uh, what, what, what was the, the, because there is a, a story behind him, like I said, when he visited the tomb of Saladin, so that is one of the more famous stories of his, his travel to the Middle yeah. East. So let's talk a little bit about his story, visit to Saladin's tomb as well. Well, I... <laughs> I don't know much more about it than that he visited it. Hmm. Because it, isn't there a famous photograph of him standing by the tube? So am I might wrong that there, there is, is, I believe there is a photograph of him there, isn't there? I believe there is too. So, so I want to talk a little, before we go into First World War, I want to talk a little bit about his, not his uh, army commanders, and of course we're going to talk about sort of famous army commanders of the time, and I, I want to bring up the three, three people, mainly that is, of course, Helmut von Moltke, the Younger, and the Hindor, Hindenburg, and of course, the famous Ludendorff, who all three, and both all three of them will be, of course, essential under World War One. You don't want to forget Schlieffen? Of course not, no. Yeah. <clears throat> Schlieffen was hired in 1891 as, as chief of the general staff, so um, William was was in power then. <clears throat> so, but I want to talk a little bit about the, the role, of course, in preparation of the army and, you know, Ludendorff and Hindenburg and Henry von Moltke, the younger, as well, and talk a little bit about them under and their role in the building of the army and then German Navy, because before before World War One, the German Navy, I think, was the second only to Britain. Uh, before the World War One started. Well, it depends on what date you're talking about. Um, <clears throat> the German fleet became 
um, by, by its size, uh, number two in the world only uh, in 1907. Uh, mm. It was something like 10th, or I, I'm just making this up, but it was it was an inconsiderable fleet in 1897, uh, 1897 uh, when the, the major push to establish Germany as a, as a sea power began. Mm. So let's talk about the outbreak of World War One, and I want to bring something up because there, I want to have your view on this because there, in, there's a historian when the Archduke Ferdinand was shot that he believed that if Austria had invaded almost immediately as it crosses Berlin to that, there would have been much more sympathy instead of since they waited you know, so long to invade and they, they discussed the World War One could have been avoided that if they had been invaded almost immediately, that could, the World War One could have been avoided. Is that true to this? That, what, what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> this is a terribly important problem. Uh, but may I may I make a suggestion? Yeah. Um, the, we we um we have jumped into the First World War, and the, the, there are a whole bunch of really important things that happened before the First World War yeah. that make Wilhelm's behavior in the First World War uh, make a lot more sense. Can of course, I, yeah. Go ahead. Can I be so bold as to to suggest um, a brief look at what the historians have had to say about William the Second. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I go think, ahead. I think it will help make sense of a lot of these things that, that we're we're getting into. You know, yeah, it, it's what we what we call historiography, but um, it's the history of the history of, of William the Second, if if you like. Can mm. I say a word or two about that? Oh yeah, of course. Be my guest, absolutely. Okay, okay. Um, after Bismarck's dismissal that, that, that you asked about a little bit ago, uh, and then with the increasingly turbulent period of German diplomacy after Bismarck's departure, and then after the, uh, after the First World War especially, it became common amongst not only historians, but many, many uh, Germans themselves uh, to define William II, and sort of the catastrophe of German history, who uh, squandered uh, the great legacy of Bismarck. Bismarck being solid, well uh, considered, smart, ruthless, but always careful. Wilhelm being the exact opposite, you see, careless, loud, unthinking, uh, unsteady. So that Wilhelm, in a sense, has made been made the scapegoat. Uh, for everything that happened uh, uh, towards the end of Imperial Germany. Um, <clears throat> this was a, um, a view that was repeated um, immediately after the Second World War um, by, a, by a German historian by the name of Erich Eich, who um, really took the, the charge and systematized it, saying, in William II, you have um, uh, a, an explanation for everything that came afterwards, so that in a sense, uh, William can be seen as the essential transition to the Hitler uh, regime. Now, what happened in the uh, in the nineteen uh, sixties of you know fifty years ago? and I don't know whether other people whom you've talked to have said anything about this, is that this idea uh, was of uh, William II being the, uh, the, the source of all the problems. It was challenged by a number of German historians, uh, the most important of whom was named Fritz Fischer. Has his name come up in, this, uh, in, your, in your podcast before? No, I don't think so. No. Well, basically what Fischer argued was that the war guilt clause in the Treaty of Versailles, that Germany bears sole responsibility for all of the damage, that it was basically right. And that if anything, the charges against William II uh, were, too, uh, were too, too lenient. Uh, the Germans in the July crisis had systematically set out on a, on a program of European 
conquest. They knew absolutely what they were doing in July uh, 1914, and that they did in fact bear uh, the guilt for the First World War. However, what made this particularly interesting is that Fisher had very little to say about William himself. Instead, he puts the blame uh, on the chancellor at the time, Theobald von Beethoven Holbe, and that he was the evil genius behind this, and that he had embraced foreign policy goals much like those of Hitler, this in July of 1914. Well, this then set the, uh, the, the, the stakes in the debate among German and other historians for the next 10 or 20 years, uh, actually. Uh, and it <clears throat> emphasized not only Beethoven Holweg's personal role, but the kind of institutional and economic pressures that had led to it. Uh, the fact that there were aggressive statesmen throughout uh, the German bureaucracy, uh, the fact that there were very loud uh, pan-German and other nationalists who had um, access to people in power, and particularly since uh, the role of German banks and heavy industry, uh, the aggressive aims of these people were also prominent in the German system. So that there were a lot of structural things uh, that went into this whole story. Wilhelm, in this vision, becomes kind of a, well, a parenthetical, a marginal figure in the whole business. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the historiography of William, William II since that time has been really, really dominated by one man. And this is John Rural, um, who maybe be yeah, familiar, yeah. Um, who became um, the world's leading authority on William II and spent his life studying William II, who produced, before he died, alas, two months ago, uh, produced a biography of some 5,000 pages in which he traced down every conceivable um, documentary lead uh, that he could find anywhere, I mean literally anywhere in the world he could find it. <clears throat> And he said, Fisher basically has this absolutely wrong. William II was, in fact, the heart and soul of this whole regime. He wielded a near absolute power whenever he wanted to. And his great achievement was to put all of his um, lackeys in positions of power so that he himself was the single most important um, the single most important figure in the whole uh, in the whole story. Well, Rolls' book is a um, is a fascinating thing to read. Well, it's it's a long read. It's been published mm -hmm. in three volumes in both. It might English. take a while. It will it will take a while. Uh, fortunately, um, he also in 2014 published a slim volume of about 150 pages in which he summarizes uh, the whole thing. And it's, 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 a, it's a good book to read along with Christopher Clark's, um, for one thing, because the two men uh, saw things in quite different terms. I will say <clears throat> that the judgment now, at least my judgment on the work of John Rural, is important for what we're talking about uh, today is that for all of his um, devotion uh, to studying the Kaiser, he actually um, presents a rather skewed uh, view of his importance. In other words, he himself has so concentrated on the life of William that he overestimates, he loses sights of the constraints uh, on, uh, on Wilhelm. Um, he presents a portrait of Wilhelm, the manipulator, the man who was able to manipulate all of those in environs and to, um, and to control them, and has overlooked the extent to which the people whom he appointed uh, learned to manipulate him. So that some of the most fateful decisions that were made in the course of his reign have to be re-examined carefully to find out, well, who was influencing whom? 
Now, now I want to ask what are, what is your take on this? What what do you think about the compared what chickering and grow? What what is what is your stance here? It will help. Well, I say I have to say that um, I I've I've always admired John Rule. He's a, he was a wonderful man. Uh, and I was very fond of him, but I really do think uh, he was wrong. And frankly, I found Christopher Clark's book, the one you read, um, uh, a much more balanced and credible view because he, he, he poses yeah. specifically uh, the problem that in many cases, uh, William's advisors were manipulating him uh, rather than the other way around. And I'd say if I were to recommend to a student uh, a single book to read on William II, then Chris Clark's is certainly uh, the best one uh, to do. Although, in all fairness to John Rule, um, I would also recommend a look at the at the short one. <clears throat> Maybe not the long one in the first time. But no, that's thought. I hope you understand now a little bit of the mentality and of course yeah. of Wilhelm II. So let's go on the world, world War One and what is uh, because as you know, we talked about, for example, Clark's work. It does seem to me that. Wilhelm's second actual involvement in the World War One, as the like uh, what other Allied, and we will talk about this as well. What Allied propaganda made it seem, Wilhelm's first, sorry, Wilhelm the second actually did not have that much involvement in the actual war uh, strategy, and but and you know how what what he were going on on the scene theater of war. Well, in 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 my view. Uh, the the First World War is, in a sense, a, a, a fitting climax to the uh, rule of William II, because in many respects, some of the themes that were already in operation during his peacetime reign um, reached a climax uh, during the First World War. Um, <clears throat> I do believe that many of his central advisors recognized just how unreliable and how erratic uh, the man was. He was also indiscreet. He would say terrible things in, in, in public, embarrassing, uh, humiliating many people uh, who had been in his confidence. <clears throat> it also uh, suggests that he severely overestimated his own capabilities, his own skills, and his own knowledge. And um, many of his advisors, certainly before the First World War, had learned um, that you control him primarily by keeping things from him. Um, I think in this respect, probably the, the major turning point is what happened in um, 1908 in connection with the, uh, the Daily Telegraph affair. Uh, I don't know whether that is anything that you're that you're listening? Yeah, please bring please bring it up. Yeah, um, Wilhelm was by this time well noted for his indiscretions, his public indiscretions, and they seem to have reached a high point when, in November uh, nineteen o eight, um, he allowed the publication of an interview he had had uh, with a British journalist during which he said a number of astonishing uh, and untruthful things, um, such as that he had always been uh, um, Britain's greatest friend, uh, that he had supplied the British army uh, with operational plans uh, against the Boers, which he and his general staff had drawn up for them, and that the German Navy represented no threat to Britain whatsoever. It was instead directed against uh, Japan and China and the Asian yellow peril. Well, <clears throat> this interview before it could be published had to be countersigned and approved by the chancellor at the time, whose name was Bernhard von Bülow. Uh, and he did, and the publication of that interview resulted in an almost unanimous howl uh, from the German public uh, calls, if not for his abdication, 
or at least the trimming, significant trimming of his powers. In other words, constitutional reform in the direction of a parliamentary monarchy. <clears throat> well, in reaction to this, Wilhelm did um, retreat. His public interventions became less frequent, less loud, and less provocative, as if he'd had his his um, his tail uh, um, wagged or his 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 tail beaten, and he became less prone to doing these kinds of things. Um, I say this in part because uh, of one aspect of this, and this is the uh, the the behavior of Bulow, who was the chancellor and was constitutionally responsible uh, for signing off on this public statement. When Bruno told the parliament that he had not had a chance uh, to check it off and simply let it go across his desk, he was lying. Uh, he had read it. And the question becomes, why did he nonetheless uh, allow the publication of it, if not to embarrass the Kaiser? Mm. In other words, in a, it was in a sense uh, a form of embarrassment uh, that Bruno was trying to inflict on his own sovereign. I say this because it's just one notable aspect of the prospect uh, of the of the uh, uh, the truth uh, that the manipulated were doing. In fact, the manipul the, were doing the, the, the min those who were supposed to be manipulated. No manipulation. Manipulation. All right. Um, Bulo was uh, succeeded uh, in the summer of 1909 uh, by Bateman Holbeck, who um, had by this time pursued a rather, um, a rather uh, um, classical uh, bureaucratic career up through the various offices of the Ministry of the Interior and the Office of the Interior. So he's known to be a very cautious, um, melancholy, um, um, and careful man, much more so than Bulo, who had made his career by flattering uh, the Kaiser. Well, one of the things that Bateman did was to realize the wisdom of withholding a lot of things from the press, from William's attention. In other words, he began to withhold information. And he was certainly not the only one who did so. Among those others who withheld information from him, and this I conclude from some of my own work, were the, the leading soldiers, in that uh, the full specifics of the Schlieffen plan were not shared, I'm convinced, uh, with the Kaiser before they went into operation. You may be familiar with the famous reproach uh, that uh, William gave in late July uh, 1914 to the chief of his general staff, Helmut uh, von Moltke the yeah. Younger, said that the, uh, when Moltke told him uh, that the German army could not disband its plan for a war and attack only Russia because they didn't have any plan but one that envisaged an attack against both France and Russia. And William was appalled and he said, well, your great uncle wouldn't have told me that would suggest that indeed he did not know the specifics uh, of the Schlieffen plan. So I'm only going to say about this is that um, <clears throat> it got out certainly amongst the top leadership, civilian leadership and military leadership in Germany, uh, that you have to be careful on what you tell the Kaiser. Mm. Okay. So, so now let's talk about 1918 because of course, 1918. Get, not 1918, because Ludendorff gets his famous collapse, and there is a famous story as uh, sorry, Christopher Clark could recite where he later under the Kaiser's exile, telling some I don't remember what they said exactly, but they say same post something, and then the Kaiser replies back right, well you are the one who got a breakdown in nine in nineteen eighteen and kind of roast him back in sense I think it's something about Hitler, what he what he said it said something about Hitler in the later years. And then he said the Kaiser replied that the, the words that he did, you know, 
you are the one who had the collapse in the, in the 1918. But I want to talk about the abdication because there is, of course, a story surrounding this as well. And the famous kind of, not really the revolution, I would say, but when the, the Weimar, newly found the Weimar Republic goes in and say the, the Kaiser that he had to abdicate. But it does try to become, not, not make move its way around this, I believe, by saying that maybe he should become a constitutional monarch and not and give up the title of emperor or kaiser, and then become just king of Prussia, of Germany. But of course, as we know, he will abdicate, but it does seem to try to still find a way to keep his power as but as a constitutional monarch before he finally realizes that he has to abdicate. Yeah. <clears throat> um, before you can come to 1918, it seems to me that you have, yeah. to, you have to go back uh, to 1914 and then look yeah. at happened in the interim because the abdication and the circumstances of the abdication make more sense if you yeah. know what to, to him uh in the meantime um of course you, should we should we talk about the july yeah. crisis we don't talk we can talk briefly about it yeah uh, okay um keep it in mind that um the position of fritz fisher had been that the the major decisions had been made by Bateman Holweg for totally um, aggressive purposes. And that the Kaiser had to be, in a sense, dragged along. <clears throat> well, we know now, uh, thanks in part to Chris Clark uh, as well, uh, pretty intimately what happened in those, in those, uh, in those days between the assassination uh, and the outbreak of war. And um, <clears throat> William had I, said- If, if I may, do, if I may do, uh, interrupt you for a second, I'd rather ask, of course, what, what do you think about about uh, Tuckman's work on 1914 and Guns of August? I've got to ask, what, do you, what is your view on that work? Well, um, I'll say this. Um, I read the, I read that book in the early 60s when it first came out, and it was my first glimpse uh, into this whole thing, and I was just I was just riveted by the book. I mean, it's a it's a real uh, page turner, um, and um, it the book had come out after uh, the Fisher dispute had begun, but she took, as I recall, no notice of it uh, at all. So that it was a question here that she accepted the still dominant view that the blame for the outbreak of the First World War did not belong with Germany alone, but that it was shared um, by all of the powers. And in this way, she's able to go from capital to capital with the, uh, you know, with the, with the narrative. And, and again, if I may bring up something she wrote, and of course that would resonate with Kennedy, is that after World War, World War I, they would ask me, Asked that like, some I don't remember who, but there's some that like, someone would ask like how did they come to this and the I don't and again I don't remember the person who recited but they would, would say you know oh I don't I don't remember and that that kind of stuck with uh, Kennedy as well later that they, he didn't want this case when the Cuban Missile Crisis came that he didn't want someone to ask later how did they come to this oh well I don't I don't remember I I don't remember that. I do believe there's some famous line in Tuckman's book that cites some some something along and, and again it's a while since I read the book but I don't so I don't remember and that's why I'm not a historian but I don't, there's something in along the lines of this. It's been sixty years since I've read it, so <laughs> that's, fair, that's fair enough. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. Back to back to yeah, back to the. I just wanted to ask about what your thoughts on Tuckman's work because it's kind of I felt that it was kind of relevant in, into the situation. Yeah, uh, if you look at the, um, with the stuff that's now being published on the origins of the First World War, you will not find Tuckman's book um, uh, cited. It was, um, it was a very influential and very well-received book at the time, uh, but <clears throat> it's not um, an original piece of scholarship. Hmm. So that's, again, before we go into 1919 on the application, we wanted to talk about what you, 
what you wanted to talk about before we dropped a little bit well and I apologize again for doing that, but let's talk a little bit about the nineteen fourteen to nineteen eighteen as well. Okay. Okay. Um do you want to start with the July crisis and William's role in it? Yeah, yeah, yes, please. Okay. Um, it was days after, and not weeks after, the assassination that Wilhelm uh, ensured the, assured uh, the Austrian ambassador in Berlin that uh, no matter what the Austrians did, the Germans would stand with them. This he said on his own. Uh, and th that at least gave the Austrians reason to think that if they were to move in any military way against the Serbs, they would have the backing of their of their allies. Now, um, in a sense, to make this official, um, the Austrians sent uh, an emissary to, to Potsdam uh, <clears throat> in early July. This was Pius and um, Hoyos and the, Aus and the Austrian ambassador then met not only with William, but also with Eitmann Holweg uh, uh, and a number of other um, leading German civilians and soldiers, although not with Moltke nor with Tirpitz, both of, our, both of whom were not there. But the German leadership discussed it now amongst themselves. And uh, under Bateman's um, under Bateman's leadership, uh, they agreed with the Kaiser's position that um, the Germans would support the Austrians. Um, certainly, um, the leading German soldier at the the meeting, this was Falkenhayn, who was then the the Minister of War, uh, agreed because he thought a, a general war was inevitable. But the Germans counseled the Austrians that they should in fact move militarily against uh, the Serbs, but that they should do so quickly while international public opinion uh, was still so upset over the, um, over the assassination of the Archduke and the Austrians could count on some considerable international sympathy if they were to move to punish the Serbs. Um, the Austrians did not move quickly. They had their own problems, particularly in, assur in uh, assuring uh, the consent of the Hungarians for this whole thing. Uh, all the while, the Germans were screaming at them, would you please get something out? They knew that uh, some kind of ultimatum was, was in the works. Uh, and when it happened, um, the Serbs responded in a in a somewhat uh, in a somewhat encouraging manner that they would be able to accept many aspects of the ultimatum. And when William heard this news, he said, "Oh well, we don't need to have a war after all." And uh, well, the Bateman Holweg made sure that. Um, this did not get into German policy, and he um, did not encourage uh, the Austrians to make a, uh, their own um, positive response to the Serbian response. Um, <clears throat> and then, in the end, as I as I mentioned a moment ago, William also said, uh, as the uh, Germans were about to announce their mobilization plan, "Well, we don't have to go to war uh, with France." If Britain is going to keep uh, France from fighting us, and it looked to William at that point as that was going to happen, uh, we can simply fight the Russians alone. And at this point, he was informed now by Moltke that that was not possible. We should, um, we should also mention, if, if I may, yeah. if I may, we should also mention that France and Russia, of course, have signed an alliance of either where attack the would yes, be. I, I should have mentioned would be a, yeah, where they would attack the aggressor. Yeah. Which, of course, initiate the animation is Germany. Uh, William's behavior during the um, July crisis did not suggest that he was the driving force behind uh, the German uh, reaction to the crisis, that this was being formulated elsewhere. 
and that there is good reason to believe that it was principally Bateman Holvig uh, who was in the driver's seat about all of this. In any event, uh, <laughs> the war broke out. Okay, we, hmm. we can we can agree on that. The yeah. war broke out, uh, and at that point, um, William II became the commander and chief of the German army. And the question is, how would he react to this challenge? And the answer mm -hmm. was, and it became clear almost immediately, he was totally, totally over his head. Uh, he had not the slightest uh, idea of what he should be doing, aside from making speeches. So um, what happened was that the uh, military direction of the war devolved into the hands of the chief of the general staff, Helmut von Moltke, um, while the chief responsibility uh, for civilian affairs uh, became uh, the charge of Bethmann Holweg and uh, the, the Ministry of War, which began uh, to work out the bureaucratic um, guidelines for uh, administ administering the, the home front. The remarkable thing about this whole thing is how very little a role uh, Wilhelm played in either of these theaters. Um, Moltke lasted a couple of months. He had a nervous breakdown himself um, in the course of the Battle of the Marne uh, and had to be replaced. The choice of a successor was Williams. Uh, and he asked around, but took, in a sense, the guy who was most at hand, and that was Falkenheim, and soon became um, dependent for most of what he knew uh, about, the, uh, about the operations on Falkenheim himself, uh, and was thus very dependent on Falkenheim for uh, <clears throat> what he knew about the war. This, despite the fact uh, that Falkenhayn was making enemies tooth over nail himself and amid much pressure, popular military and civilian uh, to dump him. Um, William was reluctant to dump him because he knew that the only people who would be um, credible candidates as successors were going to be Hindenburg and Ludendorff. And um, William feared rightly so uh, that they had already replaced him as kind of the focus uh, of of loyalty uh, and admiration uh, in the in the in the German um, uh, ruling oh. team of things, and he was right about that. But he he saw no um, alternative in the summer of 1916 to appointing the two military his, uh, heroes who um, were in charge of the war effort for the rest of the war. <clears throat> what this means to say is that um, William increasingly became an, irrele an irrelevant factor in the German prosecution of the war. Mm -hmm. um, his headquarters um, were pretty well uh, encapsuled off. Um, the, uh, the soldiers who did know about the war were reluctant to inform him, so that he was pretty well ignorant. Um, we, have, uh, we have lots of testimonies as to the atmosphere of dreadful boredom that reigned uh, in, the, in the imperial headquarters in which uh, William uh, resided, as if there were no war going on at all. He himself was not subject to rations. He ate well, he drank well. Uh, they spent away their, uh, their, their days uh, listening to Wilhelm uh, rant and playing Scott. So um, it was a, an atmosphere of dreadful boredom. So that when uh, the, the demand was made uh, that Wilhelm uh, abdicate, <clears throat> there were very few people uh, in the leadership who were opposed to the idea. So that uh, Wilhelm might say, "Well, um, if I can't if I can't stay on as emperor, I'll, I'll stay on as king of Prussia," and nobody was willing to go for that either. 
And um, it wasn't until the end that they figured out that the only way they could get him uh, to abdicate is to have Hindenburg tell him, sir, you no longer have the confidence of your own army. And he had no answer for that question. And at that point, he agreed. I want to talk a little bit before we talk about the real application of Allied propaganda on Wilhelm II, because they really worked hard to demonize. And of course, this is what we talked about in the very beginning of this podcast, that the Allied propaganda really helped demonize and set the tone for Wilhelm II, maybe almost until for the half of most of 20th century and that it would set be what people would think of Wilhelm II when they heard about him. So let's talk a little bit about the Allied propaganda on Wilhelm and how they demonized him. I think I think you're right about this. <clears throat> and I can only say that um, uh, Wilhelm uh, made it really easy uh, for the British and the French to portray him as a monster all they had to do, and all they really did do, uh, was to go back and read his own speeches in which he's saying these, these terrible things about just about everything you know, and everybody. But um, it also allowed them to portray him as the evil spirit behind uh, the German behavior in Belgium and Northern France during the first weeks of the First World War that the so-called Belgian atrocities uh, were um, his responsibility. And um, <clears throat> there were, in fact, um, horrible things that German troops did on their way uh, towards the first battles uh, of the First World War. Whether or not they were quite as systematic and quite as bloodthirsty and quite as arrogant as they were uh, uh, made out to be is the subject of an ongoing dispute um, even today. But uh, Wilhelm by this time had made himself an extraordinarily inviting target uh, for allied propaganda. And if then um, found a very, very rich soil uh, in the United States where you know the popular um, popular opinion outside of the, uh, the Midwest, where most of the German settlement had taken place, was very much on the side uh, of the Entente powers. Hmm. And um, it's, it's, this is why my mother uh, thought that Kaiser Wilhelm ate uh, Belgian babies for breakfast. I mean, that's natural. But let's talk about this abdication because, and I want to do a comparison, if I may, with the Romanos, where it was when they abdicated, they were talking about sending them to Norway or England, but nobody really wanted to have them have the Romanos when they tried to escape Russia after they had their abdication. But where it was a similar problems with Wilhelm when he had to flee Russia, for, sorry, for, flee Germany. Was there any was there any issues with? I don't know. He ended up, of course, in Holland, as we know now. But was there disputes with countries that? Oh no, we don't want him here. We don't want him in exile as an exile in our country. Were there any such troubles as there were with the Romanovs when they had abdicated the throne? Well, I should think if if anything, it would be even more difficult. First of all, <clears throat> what countries are you thinking of that mm. would have taken him? Uh, well, I suppose maybe. Norway or the Scandinavian country, but uh, Holland was the uh, was the clearly the the first choice because it lay only a couple of kilometers away from his headquarters. Uh, I mean, the, if, if I may, Sweden Sweden did have fairly good relations with Ger German after the Second World War, so they would have been kind of a reasonable country to choose, right? Because they had good relations with Germany. Um. I honestly don't know of any negotiations beyond which uh, those that um, developed quickly between uh, the Dutch Queen and and Wilhelm, and he had a relation or a, a friend who offered him um, uh, to take him up in her estate, and there was a big house called the Hoosdarn uh, next door that he was able then. Uh, to buy a year and a half later and to settle in. But I think um, it probably would have been, I'm only speculating here, that it would have been more attractive for him in, in Holland than perhaps 
uh, any other place. And certainly, as far as logistics were concerned, it was an obvious choice. Were the danger when he went into exile? Were the danger of for his life that he would people try to were angry at him for losing the war, or were the dangers of assassinations when they when they had to escape Germany? Well, there was uh, at at the initial stages of his of his flight uh, <clears throat> from Belgium, uh, there was a lot of um, anxiety on his part, but also on his own, uh, uh, on his own uh, retinue, uh, that he would be killed by, um, con well, socialist troops, um, German troops. The Free Corps at this point? Or what uh, they're, not free, they're not Free Corps, but he's worried about the left wing uh, uh, troops. So what they did <clears throat> was they, um, sent him out in a tray, but train, but very quickly stopped the train uh, and got him out and put him in a car and drove then to the Dutch border while the train went on to the same place um, in an attempt to um, sort of mislead any any uh, potential wrongdoers. So yeah, he was he was afraid for his life. Hmm. So let's talk about this year's exercise because he lives quite a long time after his abdication until 1941 during the Second World War. So let's talk about his life in exercise, what he is doing with his time. And of course, when Hitler comes to power, he. And I, I want to talk a little bit about as well because he does become an anti Semite. I'm not sure if he was this during his reign of the throne, but he does become an anti Semite as well a little bit because he, he blames. Was. He, he blames the Jews for, for the loss after World War One, as Christopher Clark writes about, that he does blame the Jews, and that he, and yeah, he kind of buys into this myth that they stand us in the back of the First World War and at the home front. And so let's talk a little bit about this anti-Semitism as well after his application. And I'm not sure if he was much of an anti-Semite during his reign, but he would become an anti-Semite. At least well, after his abdication, oh. I can answer that question: Is that he was an anti-Semite uh, before the war? <clears throat> John Rural again has has written uh, or has discovered reams and reams and reams of statements that were anti-Semitic. Now, admittedly, he did have some Jewish friends, but um, you know, he was uh, he was never uh, above um, the um, the the, should we say the staple um, prejudices against Jews that were common uh, in Imperial Germany. So but by no uh, stretch of the imagination can he not be called an anti-Semite. But um, <clears throat> it became increasingly, how do I want to say, um, increasingly um, loud, increasingly prominent uh, uh, as he did leave power. And then as he, in a sense, uh, rotted away the rest of his life uh, in Holland. Uh, and certainly by the end, after the coming to power of the, Na of the Nazis, uh, there, was, there was no disguising it. He does seem to oppose Hitler a little bit at first, but when he sees what he's doing, when, when he's winning, winning the war, war in the first phase, of the Second World War, he does seem to be rather impressed, maybe not of Hitler himself, but his military achievements, at least. Okay, um, all right, let, let, let's be let's be clear on this. Um, his principal concern, in fact, his only concern after he went into uh, exile, was to uh, be returned to the throne, or at least have one of his sons return to the throne. This was his principal interest in German politics, uh, which he uh, which he followed very closely, and so did his sons. Um, his initial impressions of the Nazis were uh, not particularly impressed. Uh, they seemed like a bunch of rabble-rousers, but only after Hitler began to emerge as a major force in German politics did Wilhelm begin to take him seriously. How? As um, a route uh, to William's own return. In other words, his principal hope of Hitler 
uh, was that he could persuade um, um, Hitler to bring him back uh, to the throne. Um, there were many, many um, uh, um, pilgrimages of leading Nazis to Dorn. Uh, Goering, among some uh, others, was a frequent visitor. And the subject was always, um, what are the Nazis going to do to bring me back to power? And of course, Hitler knew not to deny this. He had never had any intention of restoring the monarchy. He, he called went, him a fool at some point. Yeah, he, he thought he was a, he was, he, he was a fool. Um, <clears throat> now, William, like many other skeptics about the Nazi regime, um, were favorably impressed after between 1939 and 1941, between the conquest of Poland and up until uh, the summer of 41, when the when the Russian campaign uh, be, started to go uh, to go haywire, uh, Wilhelm. Uh, took pride in the fact that the leaders of Hitler's armies were young officers in his own uh, army, and that in a sense he, William, had trained them uh, for their great destiny. In other words, he tried to take as much credit uh, for Hitler's successes as he could. So let's talk about this step, because as we as we know, he wanted to be buried only if in Germany, only if the if the monar monarchy came back and. Of course, to this day, there's still no monarchy in Germany, so he is still is resting in Holland to, the, to this day, because he did not want to be buried back on German soil until Germany became a monarchy again. Uh, I don't know what the exact circumstances were, but I can see why um, the Nazis might have been reluctant to see him buried on German soil as well, uh, in part because he still had sons um, who had a claim uh, to the German throne. Um, <clears throat> besides, when 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 the the monarch died, there were other exciting things going on. Hmm. Now, I want to talk a little bit about his sons because they haven't been much spotlight in this episode. But where did his sons, when the Nazis came to power, were they committed Nazis or were they? as well as skeptics to the Nazi regime? Um, two in particular of his sons are important in this regard. <clears throat> the one is August Wilhelm. Um, I think he was the third or fourth of the sons. Uh, he was the most committed of the Nazis. He was a member of the Nazi party. He made no secret of his sympathies public uh, before 1933. <clears throat> The other one uh, has been the subject of a great deal of controversy in Germany of late, and this was the first of the sons, uh, Crown Prince Wilhelm himself, who um, has been, um, well, it has now been shown conclusively that he uh, was very much complicit uh, in uh, Hit the popularization of Hitler's movement that he himself um, actually joined a number of Nazi organizations. Uh, and then after 1933, he appeared uh, for one thing at the day of Potsdam in March of 1933, alongside Hitler and Hindenburg, that he was at a number of uh, Hitler's uh, great rallies endorsing the regime. Those are the two principal ones. Uh, about the opinions of the rest of them, I can't say very much. Hmm. I think we're gonna run it up there. Well, but I want to ask before you go: do you, What do you think is the legacy of Wilhelm II, and how do you think compared to what people, of course, see and listen to this episode on the really more recent work on Wilhelm II? What do you think? How how has opinion of Wilhelm changed over the centuries after World War One up on, on to, up to, until today? This is a this is a fair and interesting question. <clears throat> Because if you look at the alternative interpretations that have been available about the Kaiser, it hasn't been a particularly flattering range, has it? Uh, right. from, being a, from being a monster uh, to being a moron uh, to being irrelevant. 
Now, <laughs> none of them uh, is anything that I would hope would be said about me uh, in in looking mm -hmm. back. And um, <clears throat> I'm saying I I think it's it's worth noting that this has been an issue in in German politics in the last couple of years. Let me just say for for, for a moment about this. Um, the Hohenzollern dynasty uh, is making a claim for um, properties that they owned that were confiscated um, uh, after 1945 by the Soviet regime, but then were in a sense repatriated to the Germans uh, in 1989. And they're, they're claiming that they still have the legal title uh, to a lot of these properties, the most famous of which is uh, Sicilianhof in Potsdam, where the Potsdam Conference met in 1945. This is now, you know, it's a it's a it's a public uh, piece of property, uh, but there are lots of art collections. There are um, there are uh, museum items, all of which uh, the um, the Hohenzollern dynasty is now trying to sue the German government to get restored. So mm -hmm. that the whole thought of the Hohenzollern dynasty, what it has meant for Germany, and in particular, the role of the uh, the German crown prince in bringing the Nazis to power has been a subject of intense and broad uh, discussion, not only among historians, but uh, in the broader public as well. Um, oh. It appears to have reached um, a resolution in, in which the Hohenzollerns have lost on all fronts. Do you feel, do, what is your thoughts? Do you feel like the Hohenzollern, current Hohenzollerns have the right to the, the art world and property inside the palace, or do you feel like it's should it's now but it should belong to the public? Um, my own view is no, um, certainly um, morally and culturally, although um, the verdict was ultimately based on a legal uh, clause <clears throat> Uh, in the German law that governed the repatriated things in, 19, uh, in 1989. And this was that all of these things will be restored to people who did not play a significant role in the coming of a dictatorship after the Second World War, and by which mm. they included both the Nazis uh, and the uh, East German dictatorship. And, and this turned the crown prince, uh, William, into the main character of interest because he was the one uh, who, whose role was most prominent. And he, because he was, he was the heir apparent to the throne. And um, the, um, the current head of the Hohenzollern family uh, was distressed by the way in which historians uh, began to talk about the Hohenzollern dynasty, and he tried to shut them up legally as well. A number of my friends have run up very uh, large legal expenses in trying to defend themselves against the lawyers of the Hohenzollern dynasty. Mm. Uh, one in particular, a man by the name of Stefan Melanowski, has published a book in the last couple of years about the Nazis and the uh, and the. Uh, and the whole and soul, and then he has shown beyond the faintest doubt of the critical role that was played by the crown prince uh, in the coming of the Nazis uh, to power, and that he had lent the moral the moral um, uh, prestige of his own name and that of his dynasty uh, to the Hitler movement, and in some sectors of the German population in the 1920s and early 1930s, this was very, very important indeed. They don't seem like friendly lads, this current Hohenzollerns, do they? I'm sorry? They don't seem like friendly lads, the current Hohenzollerns, do no, they? No, 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 no. Uh, the, uh, the Hohenzollern dynasty does not enjoy a particularly good rap nowadays, uh, as we would say. Thank you so much for coming. I think we're going to round it up there. Before you go, do you have anything you want to promote or so? social media where people might find you if they have any questions or of course do you have a current book coming out soon if you want to promote that one you can do so or if you have previous books you want to write well, please do not hesitate and I will help you out here get ready for it 
uh, in August um, from the Cambridge University Press will come a book entitled The German Empire, uh, 1871 to 1918, uh, with my humble self as the, as the author. I have no mm -hmm. idea how much they're going to charge. I'd like to think it will be uh, available as a paperback, but we'll see. Thank you again so much for coming. It's been a great pleasure to talk with you today. And my name is Anand. This has been Ladat H12. We are available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, wherever you can find podcasts these days. If you are on Spotify, consider giving us five stars. That would help us out a lot. You can also give us one, though I would prefer if you gave us five. That would be very nice. If you are on Apple Podcasts, consider giving us five stars there as well. And please consider giving a review of the podcast and I will try to read it on the podcast as well if I can find it. Also, if you are on YouTube, please like, share and subscribe. On social media, we are available on Twitter and Instagram and we're not H12. Please like, share and subscribe. My name is Alan and I will see you next time.